morning, everyone. Like Daniel said, my name is Heather, um, one of the pastors here on staff. And like has been mentioned many times already this morning, I just have to give a shout out to the Next Gen team, to our summer staff, and all the volunteers. I had the privilege of being a part of uh, camp this week for a day uh, at, in Athens and in Prescott. And I'm telling you, you guys, they knocked it out of the park. It was, yeah, it was so, so good. So let's continue to pray for them. They've had a week of camp. They're going into another full week of camp with a lot of kiddos downtown. So let's continue to pray for them that God would give them the strength and the energy and the passion uh, to meet with each of those children in beautiful, beautiful ways. So this is our last Sunday uh, in the book of Psalms. We're, we're moving on to the book of Colossians next week. So we're wrapping up this series in Psalms. And um, yesterday, something happened that doesn't happen very often anymore in my family, just with the age of my kids. All five of us were in the car together for five hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of conversation, there was a lot of um, music playing, there was a lot of songs being put in the queue, and one of my kids, who shall remain nameless, um, likes a certain genre of music that isn't my favorite. Something like, you know, my, my truck broke down so I stole a horse, and uh, my dog died, and uh, the woman that I love doesn't love me back. Can anyone guess what kind of music that is? Yeah, well, I listened to a little bit of that yesterday. Um, then there's other songs we can hear where, where we hear the song, and then perhaps an artist is interviewed, and we get the backstory behind how that song was written. And you think, oh my goodness, this was going on in your life, and you wrote that beautiful song. Some of us grew up singing a song here in church, It Is Well With My Soul. And when we hear the backstory of that song, a gentleman who wrote that, um, his four daughters um, happened to drown at sea. And he wrote the lyrics, when peace like a river attendeth, attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So, interestingly enough, some of the um, most meaningful songs in Scripture also are composed out of some pretty horrific, painful, sometimes even like violently, uh, like these graphic, violent circumstances. And the psalm that we're going to be looking at today, Psalm 75, the probable um, occasion in which Psalm 75 is written is no different. It's based on 2 Kings chapter 17, 18, 19. Um, it's based on King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was the king of Judah. He was the 13th successor of King David. And the author of 2 Kings tells us that King Hezekiah did what was pleasing in the Lord's eyes. And he trusted in Yahweh. And there was no king like him either before or after. So he's up there with King David. The two political superpowers at the time that were vying to hold all of the power were Assyria and Egypt with, with Israel in the middle. It was a really turbulent time politically. And remember at this time, even Israel was no longer one nation. They couldn't, after the death of King Solomon, they couldn't get along, so they split into two countries, Israel to the north with the capital of Samaria and um, Judah to the south with the capital of Jerusalem. And so at this time, during our story, the capital of Samaria had been defeated by the king of Assyria, and the king of Judah, King Hezekiah, refused to pay what we, what we would consider like a peace payment and so then the king starts attacking Judah, defeats some of the towns. He says, okay, I'll pay you the peace payment, but then it's too late. And it just goes on and on and on. And so it's during this, you know, political powder cake, really, that the king of Assyria sends a message to the king of Hezekiah. And this is all through done through representatives and officials. He sends this message, 
And um, he basically, he gives some very blatant, outright threats, saying that there is no person or no God who is going to stand in my way. I am going to defeat you, and there's just no question about it. He outright mocks God publicly, so much so that he, he says, you know, you can't trust King. He's saying this publicly. You can't trust King Hezekiah. Don't let him deceive you. Don't let him believe, don't believe that any God will be able to rescue you. So much so that by the time I'm done with you, not my words, but theirs, um, you will be eating your own feces and drinking your own urine. Like, that's how, that's how bad it was. That's... And so King Hezekiah, of course, he tears his clothes, he goes to the temple, and he sends for a message from the prophet Isaiah to say, is there anything that God is going to do? And the, and the prophet comes back with a message from the Lord saying that the king of Assyria is going to be sent home and um, will end up perishing in his own homeland. And so sure enough, he gets a message, he, gets, he goes home, but before he does, He sends one last message to King Hezekiah, just laying it right out. King Hezekiah takes this message to the temple. He spreads it before the Lord, and he says, listen, God, bend down and hear your people. Look and see what we're going through. Please come and rescue us. And um, and it was actually at home in his own temple that uh, the king of Assyria's two sons came in and actually with their own swords took his life. And the people of Judah were rescued. The people of Judah were rescued. So that, you guys, is the context (laughs) in which our psalm was written. And so, um, yes, definitely the psalms do give us a glimpse into the inner uh, spiritual life of of the Hebrew people because it was... You know, they, are, they were their song book, their prayer book, but they also give us or can give us a glimpse into the life of a follower of Jesus if we, if we allow them to. The Psalms really become a mirror that we look into where we can see ourselves and see our emotions reflected. So let's read this Psalm together now that we have kind of the backstory. Psalm 75. We thank you, God. We give you thanks because you are near. People everywhere tell of your wonderful deeds. God says, at the time I have planned, I will bring justice against the wicked. When the earth quakes and its people live in turmoil, I am the one who keeps its foundations firm. I warned the proud, stop your boasting. I told the wicked, don't raise your fists. Don't raise your fists in defiance at the heavens or speak with such arrogance. For no one on earth, from east or west, or even from the wilderness, should raise a defiant fist. It is God alone who judges. He decides who will rise and who will fall. For the Lord holds a cup in his hand that is full of foaming wine, mixed with spices. He pours, excuse me, he pours out the wine in judgment, and all the wicked must drink it, draining it to the dregs. But as for me, I will... Always proclaim what God has done. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. For God says, I will break the strength of the wicked, but uh, I will increase the power of the godly. So, the question that we are faced with this morning is what are we being invited into by the Holy Spirit? What is Jesus asking us to not only see and learn, We know that history and context is very important, but what is Jesus asking us to experience here this morning? I heard it said recently that that knowledge puffs us up, but love builds us up. So what is love asking of us today? What is creator's love asking of us to build us up? If we're to dive into Psalm 75 and take a deeper look at some of these song lyrics, and the truth they hold for us today. What were some of the key phrases that jumped off the screen to you? I'm sure there were some words, some phrases that really jumped to you. These words were penned thousands of years ago. These are storytelling song lyrics that reveal truth for us today because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they also voice a somber story for us um, 
a story that I think we can all relate to because we understand the struggle and what it means to be human. But they also tell the redeeming story of what creator's love and justice look like. But if we're honest, there's some, some lines, some song lyrics here that can be difficult to reconcile. I think the first thing we notice right out of the gate is this heart and this of gratitude. This heart of gratitude because of the presence, the nearness, and the timing of God. Verse 1 says, we give thanks because you are near. Remember, this was a, this was a communal Thanksgiving hymn that was written um, for the collective, and it was um, written basically because God was being mocked publicly, so this was a response. This was a response so the people could come together, they could sing with one voice and remind themselves of who God was. A God, he is a God who is near, who is present, a God who doesn't leave or forsake, and his timing is his alone. As I, as I saw, sat in uh, Psalm 75 in preparation for today, it's funny, I read it, and I read it, and I read it again, and I, I was like, oh, this reminds me of Mary's song that we find in, in Luke chapter 1, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so I went to Mary's song, and I started, you know, reading through Mary's song, and then, of course, that led me to Hannah's song, because Mary quotes Hannah, and so then I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, we have this, this, this song that was written for the collective, and it's sandwiched, even in time, between um, two very personal songs that were written by women who experienced the presence and the nearness of God in beautiful ways, um, ways that ended, if, with Hannah's case, ended up impacting a nation through her son Samuel, and then, in Mary's case, obviously impacting the world and every generation to come through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to what Mary sang. It'll be on the screen. Mary sang, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. Hannah prayed, my heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. Friends, these, these women were literally living the waiting game. And they were looking for help. Like King Hezekiah, they sought God for comfort and knew that they needed his presence. Hannah struggled with infertility. And she suffered publicly every month, especially every year as she would go to the temple to worship. And her, she would show up, and year after year, her arms would be empty, and her heart would just be longing. Um, some of you could maybe relate to that struggle, or you know somebody who has been through that. I know I can to a small degree. I struggled with infertility and, and pregnancy losses, and it was, you know, one of the most painful seasons of my life. I remember after my body, you know, receiving the, the medical intervention it needed a couple years, I, uh, I conceived, and we were so excited, so filled with, with joy and hope. Uh, only to end up in the ER knowing, knowing something was wrong. And um, I'll never forget the doctor coming in um, after having read the ultrasound report. And I remember it as if it was yesterday because the words were just so cold and so matter of fact. Just, you know, looking at a sheet. This is a non-viable pregnancy and, um, you know, you can go home see if nature takes its course, or you can come back tomorrow for a DNC, your choice. You know when you're in a hospital ward and you're, you're separated by the curtains, and, and the curtains are intended to offer you a bit of privacy, perhaps even like contain your pain? Well, they didn't do a very good job that night. I started to weep from a place I didn't even know existed. And my, my pain seeped under the curtains and over the curtains and through the curtains. And it's almost like everyone in the ward, there was a, 
there was a respect. It got really quiet. Respect of the pain that they heard. We went home that night to receive a phone call that our nephew had been born that very, that very evening. Of course, I was so thankful that he was here safe and sound and was genuinely looking forward to meeting him. And in addition to that, I was just in so much pain emotionally. I remember sitting up in bed that night and just thinking how strange it was to have life inside you, but not to have life inside you. And I remember reaching for my Bible because it's often where I go when I'm in pain. I went to the Psalms. I still have my journals from all those years and all that struggle. And I don't know if you have ever questioned the the presence, the nearness, the timing of God like I have. But if you have, I think we're in good company. God, where, where are you? What are you doing? Are you there? I can't really see you moving. I can't feel you. When are you going to show up? When are you going to move in my life, in my body, in the lives of our children, our family, our church, our city, God? I mean, I think these are legit questions. Hannah shared some of these questions during her long infertility struggle. I'm sure King Hezekiah had a few as he went to the temple and laid the words out, uh, the threats out. Um, before the Lord. When, by the time Jesus arrived in Mary's womb, the Israelites hadn't heard a peep from God in 400 years. Imagine that silence. But God says, at the time I have planned, at the time I have planned, when all seems upside down, when God seems distant and silent, What are we rehearsing in our minds and in our hearts about the character of God, about the truth of who God is? It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. That's normal. It's good to lament. But in addition to that, in addition to that, we need to learn to to couple that with, okay, in addition to my questions, in addition to my pain, I trust, God, that you are with me. I trust that you are faithful, that you are loving, that you are just, that you are, you fill in the blank. As you wait, as you wait for God to move in your life, whatever it is you're waiting for, what song are you playing on repeat? I know what I drive my family crazy when I find a new song I love. I just hit that repeat button and it just goes. It just goes. What are you playing on repeat? Because the song that we play on repeat is going to reflect the posture of our hearts. As we wait, what are we singing? Because what we're rehearsing is going to be our narrative. And please, I honestly, I get it. Sometimes life is so difficult, even trying to find the words like, God help me, seems impossible. It's it's too daunting. It's too challenging while you're in the midst of, of your trial to cry out to God. But if that's the case, I encourage you. Find someone who is willing to stand in the gap for you. That's an act of faith. That is an act of faith. You can say to, you know, this person, I am waiting for God (laughs) to move and I'm running out of words. Or I'm waiting for God to move and I can't find the words. Will you stand in the gap for me? You're looking for an intercessor, someone who's like, I'm on it, on it. Not somebody who's like, okay, well, I need all the details. No, you just need someone who's going to be like, I'm on it, I'm on it. As we wait, it can be a test, really, of our, of, our, of our trust and our belief that God is Emmanuel, God with us, my favorite name of God's. <laughs> Do we believe that at the time I have planned, all will be brought into the light, that God will move, that God will bring justice for those who've been oppressed And wounded, those who've been silenced by earthly systems and powers and people that corrupt and control. Waiting for earthly justice, 
uh, to be granted, one could argue, is one of the most difficult things to wait for. Maybe you've seen the documentaries, the Netflix documentaries, where you know somebody is on um, death row and they're sitting on death row for 30 years and then DNA evidence proves their innocence. You hear the backstory and all along it was um, either a racial profile or a social economic profile or someone at the top just had this bias. And this person sat in jail for 30 years thinking, will I ever see justice? Will I ever be free again for something I didn't even do? On the flip side, think of the thousands of young women who have to walk their university and college campuses. And they have to sit in class with or walk across the street from the guy who assaulted them, knowing they're never going to... They're never going to experience earthly justice. For those of you who are waiting for some kind of justice in your life, this psalm shows us a really beautiful thing, that we are not always going to have to live under unjust power, that spiritual justice is coming. Because any power, any person, any throne that is set up in resistance and defiance to Jesus, one day, one day, God will place under the cross of Christ. That we can count on. Psalm 92, Psalm 97, 2 says that righteousness and justice are the, the foundation of God's throne. So you have righteousness and justice, and Timothy tells us that God can't deny his character. That's just who he is, and he can't deny that that is who he is. Paul reminds us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This week... A friend of mine wrote a prayer for another friend who didn't receive justice in the court system this week. And I echo her prayer. May we find freedom in a future that is unexplainable given the past. May you, God, bestow upon us a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. Amen, so be it. God says, at the time I have planned. So as we wait, we ask ourselves, what song are we playing on repeat? Verses four through eight um, in the psalm give a clear warning to the proud, to the arrogant. But let's not skip over these verses too quickly and think, well, I'm not standing on some wall screaming at the Hebrew people mocking God. This doesn't apply to me. No, we obviously need to dig a little deeper. There's pride in all of us in some form or another. There's arrogance and boasting and self-promotion and self-advancement. But then there's also, on the flip side, self-defamation and insecurity and control issues. All of these are a form of pride as well. I'm either all that or I'm not good enough. I can't do this. It all grows within the root system of pride. But I need us to see something really important here. What did God say? He said, I warned the proud. I told the wicked. So if this doesn't speak to a second chances kind of God or a third chances kind of God or a fourth chances kind of God, I don't know what does. We need to make note of that when it comes to God's justice. Our God is a God who sees all. Just read the story of Hagar. Look at how many times God rescued his people time and time again after they had turned their backs on him. Think of our own lives. Goodness. How many times has, has God been right there to pick you up and forgive you? Every time. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. These warnings reveal God's mercy. 
It extends to everyone. Everyone who is willing to humble themselves and accept it. Those who understand that repentance involves not only turning away, but taking responsibility, accepting your consequences, and releasing guilt and shame. So God gives this warning to the proud. Those who won't relent, those who are just hanging on to their pride. Hannah knew the truth of God seeing all because she lived through it. Look what Hannah cries out. Stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows what you have done, and he will judge your actions. Mary sang, His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Theologian Dr. Amy Ora Ewing uh, notes in her book, Mary's Voice, which, by the way, if you're looking for an excellent Advent read this December, I highly recommend. Um, she notes that Mary here is speaking about the condition of the human heart, the pride that lurks in the corner of every human heart. She's addressing the sense of superiority that is at the root system of all abuses of power, superiority. Uprooting the familiar lyrics of our own egos within our lives is, what's, is what is going to lead us to freedom and deeper surrender. Do you see, though, the consistency of God within the character, or do you see the consistency within the character of God within the passages we're reading? What we see as holding little to no value, God sees completely differently. Look at who God invited into key aspects of his story all through the scriptures. Those who were overlooked, those who were forgotten, those who were on the margins. We hold people with power and, and beauty and education and influence and, and money and charisma. We hold those people on a pedestal. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Verse 6 says, For no one on earth from east or west or even from the wilderness should raise a defiant fist. This is interesting. Today, some of you may be sitting here and you may be in a position of what the east represents, indicating the rising sun. You are in your youth. And you are full of um, energy and ability and passion and talent and hope and light. Some of you may be here and you're sitting in a position of what the West represents. The setting sun <laughs> indicating, you know, the years are gaining on us a little bit. Things are slowing down. Perhaps some of you are in a season of what the, the desert, the wilderness, the south represents. In a dry and lonely season in your life where, where um, maybe even it feels hopeless at times. You don't see a lot of growth or, or movement or life. Regardless, there's something here for us. There's a warning of sorts. From the psalmist. Don't think that because you're young and in the prime of your life, you're, you're educated, you're making money, and you're, you know, things are sailing, that you can say, I don't need God. Why do I need God? I'm self-sufficient. Don't think because you're getting older, um, you can, or perhaps you even feel like maybe it's too late, that you can raise a fist at God and say, well, where have you been all my life? And don't think that just because life is exhausting and you're parched for an ounce of living water in this season that you have reason to curse God because of your circumstances. Basically, the psalmist is saying, like, no excuse, no excuse, no reason to defy God. It's pretty sobering, really. 
This idea of God deciding who will rise and who will fall, we, ha- we have to understand the language here to grasp the beauty because it may seem like God's playing favorites. But we know from the entirety of Scripture that God does not play favorites. He does not desire that any soul should perish. This rising up in verse 7, this, this promotion or favor, sometimes this word we love to throw around, as if you get an extra dose. That's not um, the Hebrew sense of this word. This lifting up or rising up is, is a deliverance from trouble. It's an offering of safety, of victory. It's exactly what Hannah and Mary were talking about. It's God sees and God is just. Verse 7 reminds us that God is able to dismantle systems that oppress And he uproots people from positions of authority. We see it happening all over the Big C Church right now. All kinds of uprooting from abuses of power. And he is able to give those who aren't in a position a voice. One of Jesus' apprentices, John, tells us in his book, chapter 14, that the Holy Spirit is our advocate and that Jesus sits at the, at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So we have the Holy Spirit as our advocate. We have Jesus as our intercessor. What a picture. What a picture. These verses, along with um, Mary and Hannah's songs, remind us and show us how God is in perfect tune. <laughs> and his actions are consistent all throughout time. He sings over those who are oppressed and powerless, those who are vulnerable. He moves on their behalf. They are seen by God, and he will lift them up in his time. God crushes pride, and he exalts the humble. That's a form of justice. And for some reason, that completely baffles me and yet really excites me God has designed it and he desires to co-create and co-labor for us, with us as followers of Jesus to bring justice and to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've had the privilege of hanging out with um, some justice advocates and these women are forces, I will tell you. They, they see things that other people don't see or aren't willing to see. They say things that other people aren't willing to say. They, they notice those who are, are overlooked. But I will tell you, personally, I've seen, I've witnessed personally how it has cost them. It has cost them uh, relationally, vocationally, financially, mentally, emotionally. There is a cost. There is a cost. When we stand with Jesus on behalf of another seeking justice, we have to understand it's going to cost us. It's just going to cost us. And there's this little thing. It's called the sin of omission. It's not what we've done. It's what we haven't done. The sin of our silence. When we see something we know is unjust or wrong and we do nothing, one day, one day, Jesus is going to say, I'd like to talk to you about that face to face. Then there's this image in the the wrapping up the psalm. There's this image of a cup. And it's filled with all the spices of of judgment and righteous anger and and mercy. And it's not the most pleasant image to um, visualize, really. But those who have determined that they don't need God, those who have decided to live according to their own desires, after hearing warning after warning, there's this this image of what they're going to have to drink. Friends, we're all invited to the feast of love. But we can't forget that there is a table of judgment. And all I can say is I am so glad that God is the judge. And not me. I don't claim to understand it all. I don't claim to understand God's judgment, his mercy, his righteousness. But I cling 
to the truth of his love through Jesus. And that's where we need to keep our eyes, right on Jesus. The psalmist wraps up by saying, but as for me, I will proclaim what God has done. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Mary sang, for the mighty one is holy. She has done great things for me. Hannah prays, no one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. When we pay attention to the presence, the nearness of God, when we lean into that, gratitude is what is going to flow out of us. And then what matters to God is going to start to matter to us. We start to notice those who are overlooked. We walk into a room and we see the people differently. We recognize that, you know what, I have more to learn from those I serve than I have to offer. We see that God has this beautiful habit of taking what we see as limitations and he creates opportunities to co-labor with us using what we think is weaknesses and he makes us strong. But as for me, so what song are we willing to co-write with Jesus? What are our life songs going to sing? Today, some of us may be waiting on God. You're waiting on him to move in your life, in your body, in the lives of your family, your friends. This morning, we have an opportunity We have an opportunity to decide what we are going to play over and over in our minds and in our hearts as we wait. We have an opportunity to lean in and tell Jesus, okay, I'm going to trust you with this. What is your this? I'm going to trust you with this. I'll give it to you and trust that at the time you have planned, And I'll trust that even as I'm waiting, you're moving. Your love is invading. It's transforming. It's healing. You're working. Today, some of us are are waiting for earthly justice. You're waiting for that time that the truth will finally be revealed. I empathize with you. You're waiting for light to shine in dark corners. It's not easy to sit in a space like that. How are we waiting? What's the posture of our hearts as we wait? Are our hands clenched or are they open before Jesus? Have you released the outcome to God? Do you believe that God could partner with you as you wait? That he hasn't overlooked you? That your life still holds purpose as you wait? Perhaps today some of you need to take a deep dive and examine the pride in your life, in my life. How does pride reveal itself in your life? Does it show up as insecurity? Does it show up as arrogance and unwillingness to yield to Jesus in that certain area, an unwillingness to surrender to that one thing you know Jesus is asking of you. Daniel and Anna are going to sing for us right now a song. And I just want to encourage you guys to take this time to posture yourself before Jesus. If you want to stand up, stand up. If you want to sit, sit and soak. But let's take this time and consider the, song, the words of this song. Count the cost and get curious about your life song. What is it singing and what does it reveal to those around you? Jesus, we're incredibly grateful for your word. We're even grateful for the the backstories that lead to some beautiful revelations of who you are. 
in the scriptures and also in our own lives. Jesus, as we come before you now, thinking about the things that you've spoken to us this morning, about what it means to wait, what it means to posture ourselves before you, how we're doing that, what we're playing on repeat. Jesus, would you speak to us? Would you give us courage? Would you help us be curious about those areas in our lives? What is it, Jesus, that you are wanting to say to us today? We want to be obedient. We want to hear you.